My name is Scott Campbell. This is not going to be as tight and professional a presentation as the last one you saw, but um, there you go. Nor am I. I believe we are slowly coming to life. And if there's any questions or whatever, um, just raise your hand or yell, and I will uh, take care of it. You know, I'll answer it. There's no need to uh, wait till the end. So that's me, Scott Campbell, NERSC, which is the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center, which is part of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And uh, I'm going to talk about dealing with data which is non-network oriented. Um, and specifically, I'm going to talk about a version of SSH that we built that is auditing in nature. Um, outline of the talk, we're going to talk about, you know, kind of the motivations of why you are interested in uh, non-network data. This is really the only place I'm going to announce it, the death of BroPipe. Um, perhaps the most embarrassing piece of code I've ever written in my life. I am pleased to see that the input framework will spell its doom and... Uh, Briefly explain BroPipe. What is BroPipe? BroPipe takes in structured text data and generates arbitrary Bro events. So it's darn useful, but it's, uh, it's an awful piece of code. So because the utility itself is actually so useful, um, I rewrote it in Python, you know, instead of this giant ball of C++, and uh, it's just like 50 lines of Python. Um, so that's available as well. Um, I definitely suggest using that. It's not quite as efficient, but um, it's not as horrifying either. Uh, I'm going to go on to talk about some analysis on the SSH side, and then some future directions. So I have this nifty thing. Yay. Non-network data. So we need to just talk briefly about non-network data and why it is that you know I think it's so cool. Um, The bro event model is, is kind of like source agnostic as far as where stuff comes from. So uh, in starting to deal with non-network related events, it's really liberating because you know an event is an event, right? It doesn't, bro doesn't know the difference and uh, that allows you to kind of mix and match at will, which is really cool. Um, you know, you have, you can map things on top of each other that you wouldn't normally be able to do. And that's uh, been extremely useful. For data sources, um, there's obvious candidates like syslog, which is, you know, calls itself structured data, uh, web logs, which are more or less structured data. And then we've done stuff with process accounting. And actually, I built a, uh, a policy set up for cloud infrastructure as well for the Magellan project so that you can um, define local site security policy and run it against what people are doing on their VMs which is kind of cool. Um, I haven't written a lot, you know, published anything on it. Um, but that's, that's kind of the basic idea of the final bullet, is that, you know, the idea is that you have all of this data lying around and you can apply local site security policy to it in ways that you don't normally have the ability to. Um, so let's talk about NERSC's problem. NERSC is a high-performance computing center, does big data, does big open science, it's got six major platforms, really big systems, um, and all the personality that comes with it. We're moving to 100 gig network connection in a few months. We have 4,000 users, changes every year, a lot of new ones. We don't have that much control over who the users are. Everyone gets a shell account. Everyone has SSH access. Passwords are the primary source of authentication, and people run arbitrary stuff on our systems. And what could possibly go wrong? That's right. And, and so we really don't have a clear idea of what's happening, because these are you know, Linux boxes, and people are just running stuff. Very exciting. Um, so my solution, right. I, uh, Yes. Um, there is some, there, there are, you know, they're not root. There are technical limitations as far as um, network connectivity. 
on the non-interactive nodes. So you have the nodes that you log into with SSH. Essentially, they're um, ideologically, you can think of them as uh, just another Linux box. Um, then you spawn jobs, which go out to the hundreds of thousands of cores in the back end. Um, stuff that happens back there, it's a lot harder to make things like demon, spawning demons and stuff. But um, Oh, no. We, we are open science, no firewalls. We block a very small number of ports on the border, you know, Windows traffic. Um, <laughs> if you, stuff like that, stuff that is, will not and should never cross your border, um, we block. But it's like less than a dozen, um, dozen protocols, or a dozen ports, not protocols, because it's just a static uh, ACL. So wants and worries. What we want. We want to know what our users are doing. That's all. You know, it doesn't seem like much. Uh, what we don't want. We don't want to screw up their lives. Our users are here to do science. We're not here to get in their way. Uh, we don't want to introduce any new security holes. That would be very embarrassing. Um, so the code changes that we make to SSH have to be very small, well-defined, and in places that we um, have at least some domain knowledge. You know, we'll stay away from the, the crypto side and whatnot. What worried us? Privacy issues. It's a big issue. Um, it severely limits where it is that you can place this, um, particularly if you're a university. Um, in our case, we also needed political buy-off from the system administrators, because if they say no, they can make our lives hell until we, uh, pardon the vernacular, uh, you know, so as well as the user support staff. Um, we were extremely open with our user community. We announced it ahead of time. It's part of our user information packet. So we don't try to hide the fact that we're auditing uh, what's going on, because that's silly. Um, I will go into some alarming detail about what happens. If you still have um, questions at the end, I will be more than happy to answer in alarming detail. Um, and then there's long-term issues of support and, and responsibility in that you know, once you spin up a project like this, and once it's used both on-site and off-site, um, who is responsible for making sure that it uh, doesn't die on the vine? So this is um, using nice shiny boxes. I'm trying to reduce the number of text-only uh, slides, because that makes people fall asleep quickly. Um, so this is the solution overview. Uh, I'm going to go through each of these pieces one at a time. There's a missing box that used to be row pipe. Um, very happy about that. That was my favorite edit in this slide deck. So we're going to just start. I'm just going to kind of walk through what happens when you SSH it. Because SSH is something that we all use, and it's something that we really don't understand for the most part, uh, what actually goes on inside when we use it. So a parent, this is the, an, uh, a version of the auditing SSHD, which is sitting there, it's running. The user logs in. It forks. It forks itself almost in its entirety. Um, and then stuff starts happening. So the green box in your right is kind of like uh, some basic events that happen within the child SSHD as user as user logs in. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail. I have a paper which goes into a whole lot of detail. Um, the first thing that happens is a session object is created. It's where all of the authentication gets data gets stuffed. It's kind of like the foundation for everything that's going to happen. A session channel object is created then, which is kind of like a command and control for the uh, everything that happens from there on. This, these, this is not the channel for the user login information, but just kind of for infrastructure within the actual process itself. And then, yay, login happens. Shell gets spawned, or the command gets executed, or port gets forwarded, or something. Um, and you know, bunnies, kittens, stuff. I, I honestly don't know why I uh, put those in there. But it makes people laugh, and it keeps you awake. And I like that. So, so the child process, it creates its output is uh, text in nature. And um, what it does is it just throws it at a local non-blocking Unix socket that's on the system itself 
that is being um, audited. All child processes throw their data at the same socket. For simplicity's sake, we used S tunnel. It's known quantity. Everyone, you know, it's everywhere. It's well understood. It's easy to configure. Um, we didn't want to, again, we didn't want to touch, you know, we could have written something as an addendum to the SSHD code, because all, you know, all the code's there, right? Why don't, uh, but we didn't want to increase the footprint. So we just, we'll use S tunnel. You can use whatever you want. This is just what we use. Um, what the text data that gets created looks like is um, in the box on the right. And it's just a, you know, it's a blob of text. Everything, the, uh, it's written out in text. The, uh, it's structured text, which shows you know, the, the data types. It expects a time, a URI string. All strings are URI encoded so that we don't worry about spaces. We don't worry about binary stuff. We don't worry about anything. It's just a blob of URI encoded um, stuff. All of these S tunnels, and in our case, it's um, up in the high hundreds, run to a single, uh, it's a Perl script. It's called sslogmux, and all it does is it takes all of these inputs and writes it out to a file. You know, we try to keep the Unix philosophy going when we built this. We have a series of simple things that work simply and are easy to know when they break because it stops working, um, obviously. So in comes all of these um, S tunnel connections. Out comes this fast text file, which is really nice because you know if if your infrastructure breaks from there on, you can always go back and check. Text files are easy to work with. It's the same structured data, and they compress nicely, and you can read them with all sorts of things, including BroPy four, the input framework, which we talk about now, um, at least in some short. In one slide's worth. We're, we're on to Bro now, by the way. We finally found Bro, which is good, because we're at a Bro workshop. Um, top box is the text. It gets fed through the framework, and it gets turned into an honest, hard-working Bro event. In this case, it's a channel data server, which means that this is just you know, data that the SSHD server have. You know, it's like what the user will see after they type something. I can have a bunch of examples and, and work over some details on this. But most of you are familiar with what events look like. Um, some of these slides are from Lisa, where I was talking about the project in terms of uh, people who had never seen Bro. So there's going to be some basic slides like this, that kind of intermixed. But the Bro policy itself um, is broken up into six different files. There's probably more. I've been doing a lot more coding lately. Um, I guess I could read them. The first one is the core event, which is this. This is um, the basic data structures in use, basic logging. Um, it's kind of the thing that everything else gets hung on, um, all the other policies. Constant is just a file with, yeah, it's like a header file. It has uh, structural information in it. Um, auth is just a place that reads authentication-related events from the core and then um, can make some informed decisions about that, like someone's banging on your door or whatnot. Um, SFTP, because it comes with SSHD, we decided to uh, instrument that as well. And this uh, creates events based on your uh, SFTP interactions. You know, what gets moved, where, everything that, um, you can do an SFTP at audits, which is nice, because can you write local security policy against it? Um, SSHD policy is really the place, is the interface where you might change things, where you know, if you're interested in commands that people might run that you want to know about, you can, um, this is the, it's like a framework that sits on top of the core. You know, in theory, you could just add it to the core, but I wanted to create kind of an abstraction away from that so that you don't touch the basic infrastructure. And then the most recent thing is, of course, the input stream, which is you load this, and you can suddenly read from a text file. 
and rather than expecting native events to come uh, over to you, which is really nice. This is just, <coughs> pardon me, an example of uh, just a really simple change. You know, the, the code looks like if alarm remote exec is just a list of things that you don't want to see remotely executed, um, for example, bash or, you know, sh-i or something. Um, default action, you've got the, uh, that's just a listing. Most of you are painfully aware of all of this. And then to modify is totally trivial. This is one of those slides from people who are not super familiar with Row. Um, but it just shows how easy it is to add shells or strings or whatever to the uh, basic infrastructure. And this is something that would happen if you, on the, uh, the policy dot row stuff. And then this is some examples of what stuff looks like. Um, I'm sitting on a, a test box I have called Spork, and um, I remotely execute sh-i, which um, those of you in the uh, who do this sort of thing day to day know it's you know 99 times out of 100 is a very bad thing if your users are doing this, because it probably means that their account has been um, liberated by someone else. And so they, so you just execute sh-i, run id, which also tends to be something that happens a lot from accounts that are, um, you know, not those of the person running them, and then exit. This is what the client sees. On the server end, we have all sorts of stuff. Um, can you use this? Aha, Ooh, that's green. Excellent. Um, so this is what you see on the server end. And this is the, uh, the human readable log format, not what uh, the logging framework is, is generates. But uh, you just, it shows an actual connection starts. You give the key fingerprint gets logged. Um, all of the auth, any auth related messages, in this case, um, Pam is doing some goofy thing where it uh, postpones your authentication, the decision, and then finally says, well, OK, all right, you're good. Um, S is a new session gets created, new server session. This is the second box in, if you recall, gets created. A new input channel gets opened. Um, since I was using a uh, key-based authentication, the, authentic the socket gets opened. Um, you can read just as easily as I can read to you, so I won't bore you with the rest of this. The thing that's interesting, though, is that line there. That's the, uh, the session uh, remote do exec. So that's, that's the thing that's being asked to be remotely executed. And then other things happen down here, but this is the kind of the place where you instrument. This is one of the key interesting places. And obviously, we're interested when someone executes sh-i, because most normal users don't do that. Most bad people do. So a notice gets created, which is the box. This is a typical attack from a while ago, um, as you can tell from the Linux version. But uh, and I stripped out some of the uh, some of the details for readability's sake, but um, you know, login or you know, authentication happens. Sh-i gets executed. They run you know, you name a it's shocking, right? And um, they they go to dev. You know, you can read this. They they do all of these things that normal users don't do, and normal attackers do. So you know, it's. It just stands out, right? And so we have behavior rules and kind of data value rules. And the behavior rules are stuff like remotely executing a shell. That's a behavior. Unset hist file, again, a behavior that, you know, to, I can think of a dozen cases in the past five years where users have unset hist files and have not been attacking. You know, again, CD, dev, shared mem, no one does that, unless you're attacking, of course. Um, 
all of this stuff, this, is, this was kind of interesting because they were running um, HTTP on the Telnet port, which uh, on the network side should get picked up from all of the excellent bro policy. And then there's like all the goofy hacker talk nonsense, which is, you know, again, for whatever reason, every exploit kit in the world has the same stupid output format. And so you can look for that, right? You know, because why not? It's easy. And so we have data value rules and behavior rules. Um, and that's all part of the policy. You can define them. They're easily changeable. And yeah, kind of cool. Uh, yes. <laughs> this, is, this is an actual attack, which we caught. Um, soft data. What you can get with this information is really interesting because you get more than just process accounting. You get more, you get, um, in this case, we had two attackers attacking a single machine at once. They were, sh they uh, split a TTY, so they were communicating with each other. And so we get a lot of soft and interesting, almost psychological information about behaviors. Um, and this is actually a very, very, there's a whole lot more of it. There's more of it in the paper, and I've you know, got pages of this stuff. But what's kind of cool is you get a real feel for who it is that's attacking you that you absolutely would not get otherwise. Um, and what we ended up finding out is these were not complete script kitties, and they were you know, perfectly well skilled, but they really understood how Unix works. And they really understood how NFS worked. They were not idiots. And um, it, was, it was a good wake-up call, you know, because we're, we catch all of these ankle biters and script kitties. We tend to build infrastructure to catch ankle biters and script kitties, and surprisingly, we miss the non-ankle biters and script kitties. But um, in this case, we didn't. Um, but it, what, what's interesting here is, you know, the kind of soft information to understand why it is that people are attacking your systems, how it is that they are, so that you can not build you know, ankle biter script kitty detection infrastructure and instead build smart infrastructure to catch smart people. Um, and, you know, it's kind of funny to read. It's like the cats and the, the bunnies. <sighs> Past two weeks, we add, I added a bunch of new functionality. Um, the with the, lo with the new logging framework and the Elasticsearch, it seemed like a natural uh, fit. I have all this text data. I want to search it. I want to do smart things with it so that I can do more than catch ankle biters and script kitties. And um, I'm looking at Elasticsearch as one option to that. And it is just so brain dead easy to do now that um, I spent a weekend you know, adding the logging format and uh, to it. And what's kind of interesting is I, and what I found kind of limiting is that you move, using this, is you move from a free-form notion of data, because events are free-form in nature, to a transactional notion of data. Because you, can, you log, you know, structurally one thing at a time. And so I'm kind of grappling with the best way to go about doing that. Um, Seems like Matthias may have a, an option for me in there, uh, and then you know obviously the the input framework, which is really really cool and uh, really kind of fun. Future directions, um, better analysis. Obviously, um, it seems like a natural fit to try to identify users based on patterns of behavior. It's been done. At, you know, it's been talked about a lot in, in the machine learning community. It might be possible to, uh, to do that. I'm always a little skeptical of machine learning. But at least we could try. Um, and one of the next pieces I'm building in is a process accounting records so that we can tie process accounting information, which actually runs on the box, to key, keystroke and uh, what SSH thinks is running on the box. And what's kind of fun about that is that you can use this to identify um, processes who move from a user level to a root level privilege. So you get privileged transaction data or transition data. 
And that, that's really interesting because that'll show, you know, besides a lot of SUID <laughs> executables, you'll also get any successful um, boot level compromise. You will see a shell do that or a process attached to a shell do that. The other, one of the other kind of interesting things that you get access to is um, all the people running web browsers on your high performance computers, um, which we have a lot of, kind of surprised me. Uh, we get complete access to the HTTP data, and so we could run that through Bro. You know, everything that gets forwarded across SSH is just raw data, and we can pump that into Bro. And so we're thinking about doing that, but then there, there's some performance issues that I need to uh, address before we do that. And then just better access to cleaner data. Never ending uh, desire, because the logs are naturally a little, they're, they're fairly dirty, fairly noisy. Um, and then I'm open for questions.